Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning thanking you and praising you for your presence that we feel here this morning. We thank you, Father, for all the many things that you've done in our life. And Father, we just pray this morning that you would use me in the next few minutes, Father, that you would open your word and give us the things that we need. Let us, Father, take away from this so that you might be honored. For it's your honor and your glory that we're here this morning, and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. You've got the scriptures, and there's quite a number this morning that's in the pews next to you. We do that so that you can follow along and you can take them with you and read and study on your own time. And this is an important message. And as I started to write this down and put this together, it, it came to me that this is a strange message for this crowd, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that most everyone sitting here is born again, <clears throat> but we all know those who are not. We have family members who are not. There are people watching this message this morning who are not. So it's important that we understand this, and there, there's a reason for it. If Christ were to appear in the eastern skies today, are we ready? Are we truly ready for him to return? Would we be part of the group that would go, or would we be part of the group that would be left behind? I think it's a question that we all ask ourselves at times when <laughs> we see things happening in our lives that we may not understand and we may not fully get a grip on. But I want to tell you, to be left behind would be a terrible, terrible thing. The horrors of the tribulation, the terrors of the Antichrist, is not anything that I wish anyone to ever go through. On Wednesday nights, we've been studying the book of Revelation and all that will come with the vision that John was given. We have gone through the first three and a half years of the tribulation and we are at the end of the last three and a half years, a great tribulation. And we are at the point of seeing the Antichrist show himself on the earth. And it's not a time that I want anyone to have to experience. So for no other reason, this is a message of urgency. Because if you really understand what this world is going to be like, a lot of people think the world is crazy now, that it's evil now. It doesn't hold a candle to what's coming. And I don't say that to scare you or, or to make you fearful. I say it to tell you the truth. The truth is the world is dying and it's not going to get any better. But there is a light in the world and you are it. And this light that God has placed here through his son Jesus Christ is an important thing because without this light this world would already be a very dark place. But we hold a place in this world where there is a light, there is hope. So this is a message of hope. This is a message of information. This is a message that we need to take seriously and we need to see the urgency that's about this message. This time places an urgency on the church that, and the church's responsibility is severe. Over the last 2,000 years or so, the church has, quite frankly, done a terrible job. When it started out, it started out on fire. Paul and his men, as they began to opened the doors of many churches. Those churches were on fire. 
and many thousands of people came to Jesus Christ. Over the years, the fire has gotten lower and lower and lower until today, the fire can hardly be found. So, the church today, according to Scripture, does a terrible job, a very bad job. One of the things that, as I started to study this, I want you to be aware the New Covenant, New Testament, consists of three basic sections, and I want you to understand this because this is where the church has failed, I think, to a great extent. The first section of the New Testament is, would be the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all emphasize the death of Jesus Christ, the purpose for the death, the reason for the death, they do a great job, and they really explain the death of Jesus Christ. And then the next section that we get into would be the epistles or the letters. Most of those were written by Paul, with the exception of a few other writers who wrote letters to different individuals or churches. The epistles, along with the book of Acts, focus on the resurrected Christ. And that's important because the resurrected Christ is the essence of Christianity. It's why we're all here because Christ did resurrect. He did rise from the grave. He did defeat death. That's an important thing. But it doesn't stop there. Then we get to the revelation. The revelation is the unveiling the unveiling of the ascended Christ. That's where the church has failed. We teach very little about the ascended Christ. We talk very little about once Christ and the disciples stood and watched him ascend into heaven and we just kind of put an end to it there. But why? The church has not ascended, it has not taught the ascended Christ. And the church has missed a great opportunity, I think. I think when you look at Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, those verses kind of depict where the church is at. The church is standing there looking up into heaven, watching Christ ascend, but that's pretty much all they've done with it. And I want to read those verses because it's important that we look at those. So Acts chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 this morning. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, <coughs> Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven." I think the church is still standing, gazing up into heaven. I don't think we've done anything as a church, and I'm talking about the church universal with the ascended Christ. The two men in white, the references, references what the disciples witnessed they, by saying the same Jesus, which is Christ, was taken up from you into heaven, he shall come in like manner. He's coming back. But what does Christ do during the time that he, he ascended before the disciples and the time he comes back? I think it's important that we kind of focus on that this morning and talk about that. Look at Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 13, and we're going to read through 17. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am the Son of Man? Who does the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom saith ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. One of the problems that the church has had is not recognizing the Christ. The church is focused on Jesus and, and well in doing so because Jesus is our salvation. He is the sacrifice that guarantees our salvation. But when we fail to focus on the resurrected Christ, the ascended Christ, we miss the power because the power of God is in the resurrected and the ascended Christ. And it's important that we do this. It is, it is important that we address and we realize the ascended Christ, the Son of God. He's seated at the right hand of God. And it's important that we understand that. Why is he seated at the right hand of God and not the Father? God's the judge. Christ is the one that holds our pardon. He's the one that holds the truth between the judge and us. He's the one that says, these are mine. They've been paid for by his blood. And God the judge sees the blood. And he says, very well, they belong to me. They're mine. So the ascended Christ is the one who sits at the right hand of God. He's the one that sits there and intercedes for us. He's the one who makes sure that God recognizes all that belong to him. I gave you several verses that reference where Christ's position is. I want to read those. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he that uh, condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Yeah, rather, this is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? That's Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heaven, heavenly places. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. The ascended Christ is seated at the right hand of God, the judge. He is necessary for our salvation, for without him there is no salvation. He is seated at the right hand of God, interceding for us every day. In a relationship with Christ, we are in Christ. We are seated at the right hand of God. We are seated with him, and we share in the power that God has given the Christ. If you don't know this relationship, then I ask my question again, are you ready for the return of Christ? If you don't know who Christ is, if you don't know where you are in relationship to Christ, then are you ready for Christ to return? It's an important question. Many people at this point, and it's amazing this morning, we've already addressed some of these in earlier Bible study, and we, did it, we weren't even talking about this, but many people start to think and start to ask questions and start to make comments at this point when you start asking this question. And you start hearing comments like, I probably will go with the church. I was born into a Christian family. Or I think I would go because I was baptized as a kid at Bible camp. Or you hear, I go to church at least twice a year and I think I'll go. And one of the most told today is, 
I've never been very religious and don't go to church, but I'm not a bad person, so I think I'll go. I think I'll be included. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with all those? It has no understanding of who we are. Has no understanding about the truth. The truth is we were all born under a sin nature. We were all born the sons of Adam. We were all born in sin. And the only way that that can ever be changed is through the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross and the risen Christ. So we have to understand that. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus put it this way. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what does it mean to be born again? I use that term a lot because I've come to the realization that the word saved has been so misused by the church that a lot of people really don't even hear the word saved or they understand being saved as something that it's not. So I think born again is the preferred term because born again puts a vision into the mind that is a vision that we have to have because we have to understand that to be born again means that we have to be a new person, a new being, a new man. True Christianity is a matter of true relationship. In John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life. And a lot of people don't really have a good understanding of eternal life. The deal is you're going to live for an eternity. The question is where are you going to live eternity? You have two choices, only two. You can either choose to do nothing and spend eternity in hell. Or you can make a choice and follow Jesus Christ and spend an eternity in heaven. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We can't just decide one day that, well, I think I'll be a Christian. It's not going to work. There's a drawing. The Holy Spirit draws us to Jesus Christ. And the reason he draws us to Jesus Christ is because of what Jesus says here. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one will come to the Father except through him. Everyone seems to know John 3.16, especially Christians. That's kind of the, the anthem for Christians when you start talking to people. And John 3.16. Well, let's read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's absolutely true. It's correct. But there's more. There's a whole lot more. You go on down, if you read the rest of John 3, when you get down to John 3, 36, it says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there's more to it than the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There's consequences to not believing, not receiving. And that's the point. That's the purpose. And that's what we need to be teaching. There is consequences. 
Salvation is not conferred arbitrarily on people. We seem to have a, this understanding today that, oh, because I'm a good person and because I've never done anything wrong, God will just save me. God will just put salvation on me. That's, that's a wrong because you are not worthy of salvation alone because we are born of a sin nature. Salvation is by grace. It's a free gift that's not earned. Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 18 says this, What then? Are we better than they? No in no wise, for we have before proved both Jew and Gentile, that they are all under sin. Everybody is under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are <clears throat> together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throats is an open sepulcher, and their tongues they have used to see. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they uh, not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. No person can then justify themselves before God. And if we stand before God one day and try to justify ourselves, he's not going to hear us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No matter what we do, how hard we work, how good we are, all the great things we do, we feed thousands of people, we do all these other things, without God, without Jesus Christ, we are lost. And we will not be part of the people of God. We will not be raptured out of this place before the tribulation starts. We will not be recognized as belonging to God. The essential of Christ into heaven is one of the most important events recorded in the New Testament and we need to understand that and we need to be teaching that. True, it doesn't get a lot of attention. Even among Christians today, it gets very little attention. We read more about and we see more about the resurrection than the ascension. The resurrection is important. The resurrection is the sticking point or the stumbling block of Christianity. But once you get over the stumbling block, you need to understand that the ascension, the ascended Christ, is our position. It's where we are. It's what we are. It's who we are. It's how we operate. Did Jesus Christ really ascend into heaven is the other question that you'll hear. We need to understand and we need to see that because Christ ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit was then poured back out on his church. And we need to understand the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church is because he ascended Christ. Acts 2, 33 says this, Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Understand that the promise of the Holy Spirit is alive on this earth today. It is what guides and directs us. It is the power that we operate in. It is the understanding of the ascended Christ. Having accomplished redemption through his suffering on the cross, salvation is one for all who will enter the gift of redemption. Just repentance. Just know that repentance is the key to salvation. 
Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. The ascended Christ cares for his people. As they become a witness to him, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Understand what's taking place in what you have in heaven. One who would stand this is Stephen as he's being martyred for his profession of faith in Jesus Christ. What does the ascended Christ mean for the born-again believers today? Everything from salvation to relationship. We are in the long summer. The long summer is the time when we reflect the long summer is when we prepare for the fall harvest. As we're getting ready to go into the fall feast days, it's important that we understand this. The holy days, the holidays, as we go into the fall, the Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Understand that these, this is the time that we're promised the return, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement. This is for Israel. The trumpets are for the church. Atonement is for Israel. Tabernacle is when Christ will come back and we'll all tabernacle with him. He will tabernacle with us. It's important that we understand that we are at the end of the summer, about to go into these fall feast times, these are the ones who have not been fulfilled yet. So we're waiting and watching and looking for these to be fulfilled. So if, by the grace of God, these are fulfilled this year, time is short. We don't have a lot of time. How do you know when Christ is coming back? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Just told you the seasons. Verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. If you've been involved in the Revelation uh, Bible study on Wednesday night, you would know full well what that verse is talking about. In verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, as that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and the children of day. We are not the, uh, of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Whether Christ comes back this year, next year, 10 years from now, it doesn't matter. Time is short. We should be sober. We should be awake. We should be aware. We should be ready for his return. I can't tell you the day or the hour, but I can tell you the season, and we're fast approaching that season this year. So this is not to scare, to frighten anyone. This is to tell you that if you have those loved ones around you who are not part of the family of God, you need to be sharing Jesus Christ. Be sharing the truth. Need to be sharing the love of God with them. Because that's what this is. Can I get everyone to stand, please? <clears throat>
I don't know if there's anyone here who has never been born again. Like I said before, I think pretty much everyone here has been. But there may be those who are listening and those who will hear this later on that have questions. You can call me or you can call any anyone in the church, any of the elders. Ask questions. Open your scriptures. Take these scriptures. Take these verses. Study them. Look at them. Use them. This is the time that we open the altars of this church, but understand this altar is always open anytime. You don't have to have an invitation to come and pray at this altar. You can pray where you're standing. But if you feel the draw of the Holy Spirit this morning, for whatever reason, to rededicate your life, to accept Jesus, whatever it happens to be, this is a great time to do it because you, you, you're going to have this whole congregation supporting you and loving you, encouraging you, lifting you up. This is a time when you can make a difference, not only in your life, but in the life of the people around you. So <clears throat> as we stand here this morning as servants of Jesus Christ and servants of the Lord Je Lord. God Almighty in heaven who is seated and we understand the power of God the Father and we understand the love that's there and understand that we have this advocate that's seated beside him and our position is in that advocate. Just know who you are this morning and be happy and look forward to his coming. I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you all for your prayers and thank you for your different phone calls and different things that everybody does. You never know what it means to feel the support and the love of people. Um, it's, it's important. I hope you have a great week. Come back and be with us on Wednesday night if you can. Uh, just, just know that God is real. The love of God is real. And we need to live our lives in that love. And the only way we can do it is through Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask Brother Rick if he'll close us in prayer this morning. And just, just remember, have a great week. And, and just know that people love you and praying for you every day. Brother Rick.